Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Fask and Martineau's webinar, 5G Wireless, Opportunities and Practical Challenges Facing Business and the Legal Industry. My name is Jay Kerr Wilson. I'm one of the co-leaders of Faskin's Technology, Media and Telecommunications Industry Group, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's session. I'll provide some introductory remarks. I'll introduce the panelists in the order that they'll speak, and then I'll turn it over to them for the presentation. Some housekeeping matters. Please note this program is being recorded and will be available in the Faskin Institute section of Faskin.com. At any time during the program, please enter your questions in the chat box below. We will try to address as many of your questions as possible during the Q&A at the end of the program. If you have further inquiries, please reach out to our presenters directly. At the end of the webinar, please complete our survey, which is linked below. This helps us to determine future topics and your input is greatly appreciated. For those watching us on LinkedIn Live, thank you for joining us. So I wanna start us off with a few fun facts just to sort of set the context of the panel on 5G wireless. According to Statistics Canada report in March 2020, so last March, 4.7 million Canadians who didn't normally work at home started doing so as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. When you add in people who normally work from home, the number is 6.8 million or 40% of the Canadian workforce. According to StatsCan, almost everyone who can plausibly work from home started to do so in the spring. Many of the people who started working from home won't return to the office even after the pandemic is over. In May 2020, Waterloo's, Waterloo based Sandvine issued its Global Internet Phenomena Report. It found overall internet traffic grew by more than 40% between February 1st and April 19th, 2020. Video streaming is now responsible for 58% of all internet traffic. Social networking at 11% has replaced general web browsing as the second most popular application. According to the OECD's study of 14 broadband networks, there are traffic increases of up to 60% and Canada saw the highest jump. So that's what we're facing and this is where 5G comes in. I'll now introduce our panelists. We start with Paul Burbank. Paul works with Baskin's Communications Law Group to provide advice on telecommunications, media, technology issues, as well as other regulatory and administrative law matters. In his te telecommunications and broadcasting practice, Paul assists clients with a variety of policy, licensing, enforcement, and dispute resolution matters. Prior to joining Faskin, he worked with the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association. In the last few months, Paul has spent a considerable amount of time researching and writing on the ways the COVID-19 pandemic will accelerate future demand for data and help shape 5G network deployment and design. Following Paul, we'll hear from Leslie Milton. Leslie is a partner in the Ottawa office and she practices communications and competition law. She provides legal and strategic advice to Canadian and foreign wireline, wireless and satellite telecommunication service providers on all aspects of telecommunications and radio communication regulation in Canada. Leslie has been active in the recent and ongoing CRTC proceedings related to wholesale wireless services, third-party high-speed internet access, barriers to rural and remote broadband deployment, and access to rights of way. Leslie represents wireless and satellite operators on spectrum and radio licensing, spectrum policy proceedings, antenna siting and sharing, equipment certification, and other regulatory compliance matters. These are all issues that bear directly on 5G deployment. After Leslie, we'll hear from Julia Kennedy, also a partner in the Ottawa office. Julia has worked with a variety of emerging technology companies, telecommunications service providers, and ISPs, advising them on their commercial agreements and helping them through strategic business and spectrum acquisitions. After Julia, we will hear from Jean-Nicolas Delage, John Nicola is a partner in the Montreal office and he is one of the other co-chairs of the Technology, Media and Telecom National Group. He helps high growth emerging technology companies implement intellectual property strategies that generate value for their shareholders. 
He also advises clients on intellectual property issues that arise when standard setting organizations adopt new telecommunication standards. And he has acted as outside counsel in different patent pools that license patents essential to practice certain standards. More notably, JN acted as counsel to the 3G patent pool where he helped license thousands of patents that mapped on 3G. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul Burbank to tell us what 5G is all about. Thanks for that, uh, that kind introduction, Jay. And uh, I've looked at the list of people that are tuning in today, and I can say that uh, we have a, quite a range of individuals, including many of my colleagues from the telecommunications industry, all the way down to a lot of lawyers who may just be here looking for their CPD before the year ends. So the way I see my job today is to come in, pitch a few innings, and start the webinar off by ensuring that everybody watching has the same baseline understanding of what we're talking about here today. So my apologies in advance to all my tech and telecom obsessed colleagues watching and because you'll be cringing at some of my oversimplifications. And apologies to those who don't routinely deal in 5G jargon because some parts of my present presentation may sound like ancient Greek dialect to you. But my portion of the presentation is supposed to introduce you to what 5G is, but I thought I would begin by emphasizing what 5G is not. So I wanted to refer back to a little story and it uh, took place at, a, at my firm last year. And I was telling a group of the partners about our plan to launch a, a cross-practice 5G initiative, like the one you're watching today. And one of those partners who doesn't work in telecommunications in any respect looked at me and said, well, when I think of 5G, I just think of faster internet. And as a real nerd that eats, sleeps, and breathes this stuff, of course, I was offended by that statement because it overlooks the real value and the real promise of wireless. And so I provided that partner that day a much better explanation. But I subsequently heard a really great analogy and that I wanted to share that with you today. So can we put up the uh, picture, please? So I was at a conference last December uh, and FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr was there uh, in the, from the United States and he was talking about the, what the US is doing to accelerate 5G rollout. And in his speech, he noted that many of us individuals suffer from a hindsight bias that forces us generally to think about developments in technology and in life and society. Uh, but, but in technology, we think about th things as just simply being bigger and faster, better versions of what we have today. And as a perfect example of this, he pointed out to the fact that automobiles, when first introduced, were commonly referred to as horseless carriages. And when I heard this, I had already had in the back of my mind that I found it very frustrating that the single most quoted statistic about 5G used in news articles, used in marketing, used in commercials, was that 5G is going to allow smartphones to download movies in five seconds. Now, I don't know how many of you out there are downloading and not streaming movies anymore, and I don't know how many of you are actually watching so many feature-length movies at the same time that this stat actually means anything. But to me, this was a perfect example of our self-limiting hindsight bias because we're talking about a 4G device, a smartphone, enhancing a 4G innovation, digital video. My point is not that carriers and device makers are wrong to anchor their 5G marketing around smartphones and digital video. These marketing experts understand human behavior much better than I ever can as a lawyer. I can, I can assure you of that. But my point is that thinking of 5G in these terms misses its potential. It misses its fundamental promise of the technology. And so I want you today watching to be open to thinking about 5G in terms of prospective innovations and simply not just faster, better versions of what we have today. So remember, automobiles were not just horseless carriages and 5G wireless is not just faster internet, no matter how fast you can download a movie. So that raises the question, well, what is 5G? Well, today let's keep it very simple. And, and remember this, 5G is a generation of radio technology, all built to a set of standards. Once again, 5G is a generation of radio technology, all built to a set of standards. Now these standards are a series of protocols established by an organization of telecommunications authorities called the 3GPP, and there are baseline technical and performance requirements that have to meet these standards for something to be considered a 5G service. And I want to highlight for you what a few of those performance measures are. First, 5G networks will have much wider bandwidth with exponentially higher peak data rates. This is what consumers and individuals who aren't too familiar with the technology often think of in terms of speed, but it's actually a function of volume over time, megs or gigs per second. Second, 5G networks will have much lower latency with less than one millisecond round trip communication time between information being sent and being received. 
this is what we think of in terms of lag. And we've all experienced the frustration of lag in the context of a bad, slow video conference or teleconference where you can't help but talk over the person on the other end because it's taking too long to communicate. Third, 5G networks will handle greater network congestion from devices. 5G standards require a minimum connection volume capability of 1 million devices per square kilometer. As my colleague Julia is going to probably tell you later, this has massive ramifications for the Internet of Things. And fourth, 5G wireless will produce ultra reliable communications because reliability and dependability are currency in a communications network that permits mission critical applications where businesses and governments, for example, can't afford to have these services go down. And to achieve those performance characteristics, you need the network that enables it. And so we can't discuss 5G without attention to telecommunications and radio communications facilities and resources that literally establish this connection. My colleague Leslie is going to go into much greater detail about this, but we know that the architecture of 5G networks will be different and will require a much denser assortment of radio equipment called small cells, which are essentially small radio equipment operating at various but generally higher frequencies that are attached to existing infrastructure throughout urban environments. As Leslie will point out, this deployment effort requires navigating a very complex system of commercial agreements and regulatory hurdles, and it definitely requires an enormous amount of investment on part of carriers. And so once you've deployed the infrastructure that gives you that performance, you will see an entire ecosystem of applications and uses develop around it. My colleague Julie is going to walk you through some of those most exciting 5G and IoT applications, but I did want to quickly tease out an important distinction between consumer on the one hand and industrial applications on the other to show you the life cycle of innovation in terms of applic applications. So consider mobile edge computing, which is the single most pervasive industrial application we hear in, in, in the context of 5G right now. Most of us have heard of cloud computing. Well, think about mobile edge computing as a form of distributed cloud computing, where processing takes place within the radio access network itself, but at the outer edges. Now, this is an, in, this is an innovation that's endogenous to the network design itself, meaning uh, it's the physical architecture and the software of the network that enables it. Mobile edge computing is going to revolutionize data processing, just as cloud computing has and continues to today. And this is all going to fuel automation and artificial intelligence. Now, if that example seemed too complicated and made your head spin, let's consider a more consumer friendly example. Virtual reality. A competitive market for virtual reality equipment and applications has already developed. This is a massive oversimplification, but the market for now has centered on VR in the context of gaming and entertainment for consumers. And it's a very valuable product market already. Uh, but it's VR will only become more lucrative as it progresses through the life cycle of innovation and becomes an enterprise solution. This shift is already ongoing, but over time, VR will continue to move from a consumer application like gaming to novel but practical business applications, such as remote VR shopping at grocery stores when you need to, to then finally becoming an essential aspect of critical operations and businesses, such as advanced diagnostics and repair of critical infrastructure in the natural resources sector. So that's what 5G can do, but why are we here today? To get back to my question from the, from the beginning, why do we care about this as lawyers? Well, for every one of these important applications, we're funding a set of legal challenges that are going to arise. And it's going to be incumbent upon the businesses and corporations that use this technology to lead the way to adequately address these risks on their own or else face serious economic consequences or legal act from legal action or heavy handed regulation. Carriers, vendors, and other businesses with a stake in radiocom infrastructure need a favorable regulatory landscape to invest. Corporations that offer IoT solutions will need to ensure that their agreements account for traditional contracting principles, but also things like service level requirements when they are offering or contracting for connectivity as the service. And corporations researching and developing new connectivity tools and processes are going to want to protect that innovation through intellectual property. Add on top of that privacy and cybersecurity. And you can see that these 5G technologies and solutions are going to touch on so many important areas of the law. And so that's why we at FASCIN have put together this team of professionals where we canvas all of these areas uh, of the law and consider them within the context of 5G. And my colleagues are going to speak about some of these today. 
And so to close my portion of the presentation, I wanted to, uh, can we put up the, uh, the slide of statistics, please? To close my portion, I wanted to uh, call this my slide of big, bold predictions in 5G. But as you'll notice from the sources, these, these aren't my predictions. And, and frankly, they're better described as expectations because as impressive as they are, this is the trajectory we are on. So stat one, we hear so much about the national race to 5G, and there are many ways anybody can measure success. And so like any good presenter or statistician, I've cherry picked one from the GSMA, and it's the one that I wanted to make. And it's a simple stat, and it's that North America will become the first region where 50% of all device connections will be 5G connections. But note that that will not occur until 2025. And at the same time, there will be a corresponding decline in the number of 4G device connections over that same time period. This is important to keep in mind that as much as we hear the 5G era is here now, it will be years until we see the greatest benefits begin to manifest. Stat number two, the next stat comes from Cisco's VNI, which is one of the absolute best public data sets for trends on networks and devices and data volumes. And while today's discussion focuses on the revolutionary nature of 5G, that's not to say that existing connectivity technologies will simply fall by the wayside. Just as you saw in the previous stat, 4G service will continue to be an important form of connectivity for years to come. And so too will Wi-Fi, which many of us may be connected to right now. Just like mobile wireless, the volume of data traveling through Wi-Fi will increase markedly throughout the 5G era, since next generation applications will dramatically increase the supply of data, and therefore the demand for capacity over local area networks as well as wireless networks. And so we actually expect the share of traffic offloaded from smartphones to Wi-Fi networks to increase. But keep two important points in mind. First, even though the volume of data offloaded to Wi-Fi may increase, the sum total of data that we're going to be producing as a society because of 5G will increase so much faster. And we know that an exponentially rising tide of data is going to lift all forms of boats. Second, bear in mind that this only looks at the volume of data offloaded from smartphones. And this naturally leads me to my last stat, also from Cisco. And that's earlier that I spoke about the difficulty in communicating to consumers and the general public the real promise of 5G connectivity. And I pointed out our status quo bias and primarily thinking about improvements in terms that are already familiar to us. But we are gonna see machine to machine device connections outstrip smartphones in the next few years alone with a compound annual growth rate of more than four times that of smartphones. And I think this is instructive of much more important secular shift between 4G LTE era and the 5G era. We think about 5G and we see the marketing devoted to advances in smartphone and the ecosystem of applications that have developed around the smartphone. And this is why we talk about bigger, better and faster digital video. And so I see the 4G decade as an era of convergence around the smartphone as the singular device that you will need and everything will take place. And the 5G era will be a decade of divergence to the seemingly endless number of connected devices that will communicate directly with one another, composing the internet of things. And this is going to happen a lot faster than we think. At this point, I think I'll turn it over to my colleague, Leslie, who can uh, fill in many of the gaps for me. Thanks very much, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Paul has provided us all with a kind of a teaser on the kind of performance that we can expect from, from 5G. And I think Julia, who, who's going to follow me, is going to do a deeper dive on some of the neat new applications that 5G will support. I'm going to speak about some of the key regulatory inputs to the deployment of the 5G network infrastructure in Canada that is required to support these services. And specifically, I'm going to look at what I call three key regulatory inputs to investment and rollout of 5G infrastructure in Canada. And those three inputs are access to 5G spectrum, access to the location and support structures that are required for radio and, and backhaul for 5G. And finally, and relatedly, regulatory certainty, uh, because regulatory certainty is a key input into the business decision, into the investment decision in 5G infrastructure. Next slide, please. So, so first, uh, spectrum or radio frequency spectrum. There is no 5G without 5G spectrum. I think there were some more bullets. Thanks so much. Um, 
So what is Spectrum? Spectrum is a public resource. You can't see it, you can't feel it, but it's there. It's heavily regulated, it's heavily used, and it's valuable public real estate. Now, because radio waves don't stop at borders, uh, use of spectrum is coordinated by the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU. And the ITU, based on the consensus of its member states, which include Canada, has established rules setting out um, the ways in which different parts of the spectrum can be used. To, so different types of uses and then restrictions on use to, to mitigate interference between those services. Now let me pause for a minute here to, to clarify what I mean when I say uses and to provide some examples, and, and there are many. So one use would be fixed satellite service. That's when a fixed satellite terminal or earth station on the ground communicates with a satellite. There's mobile satellite, which would be a mobile terminal on the ground communicating with satellite. There's land mobile, which is our cell service or a mobile terminal that communicates with a terrestrial or, or ground-based uh, telecommunications network. There's fixed, there's land fixed. And then there's other services that we all know well and cherish, there's broadcasting, uh, satellite radio, some that you probably haven't heard of, but there's aero, um, uh, Let's see, aeronautical navigation, there's maritime services, there are amateur radio allocations, uh, and many, many more. So lots and lots of uses of spectrum. Now, in addition to mitigating interference at international borders, uh, regional allocations of spectrum also facilitate economies of scale in the production of network equipment, so in the production of radios and in the production of phones. And it also uh, allows us to roam. Uh, so when we used to travel across borders and when we will travel again, our phone works um, fantastically, which I think has both pros and cons, but mostly pros. So uh, the international rules are implemented domestically by domestic regulators. Um, who allocate the spectrum and establish the use rules around uh, the use of the spectrum in a country and uh, rules around uh, radio apparatus that can be sold and used in a country. In Canada, that regulator is Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, or ICED. ICED regulates the use of spectrum in Canada and radio apparatus in Canada under the Radio Communication Act. We have a separate regulator, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, which has general authority over telecommunications service providers, which includes wireless service providers. In the US, uh, the regulator is the FCC or the Federal Communications Commission, and the FCC has jurisdiction both over uh, the allocation of spectrum and over communication service providers more generally. Next slide, please. So I don't expect anybody to be able to, to read this, uh, the, the words on this slide, uh, the words are not my message. Uh, this is a chart showing spectrum, radio spectrum allocations in Canada. It's referred to as the Canadian table of frequency allocations. And as you can see, the spectrum is divided into bands and the different colors represent different uses of different pieces of the spectrum band. And I think the chart ably uh, demonstrates that there are lots and lots of uses that are vying for a piece of the spectrum pie, both in Canada and everywhere else in the world. The bottom pieces of spectrum that are flagged UHS, SHF and EHF, uh, those are frequency bands, uh, which we expect 5G to use. Um, they're sometimes referred to as, as low, medium and high band spectrum. Um, and, and, and they're very important to, to the rollout of 5G. Next slide, please. So as I've indicated, um, spectrum is divided into bands and, and the bands have different characteristics and, and the characteristics uh, have an impact on the si kind of services or service quality that can be supported by certain spectrum. So one key characteristic is called propagation. And propagation uh, refers to, to wavelength um, and, the, and the distance that a signal can travel. So as I understand it, and, and I'm no engineer, um, but lower bands have longer wavelengths and better propagation, which means they travel further and they can travel better through barriers such as buildings and trees. 
but the lower bands have less capacity. They can't carry as much data. The higher the frequency band, the shorter the distance the signal travels, but the greater is the capacity of the signal. And higher frequencies can carry much, much more data. So 5G needs a mix of spectrum. It needs low band spectrum for coverage. It, it needs mid band spectrum, which is a kind of sweet spot between coverage and capacity. And finally, it needs millimeter wave spectrum or high band spectrum. And this is the spectrum that can carry the huge amounts of data that we expect to be required for a number of, of 5G services um, that I think Julia will, will mention in more detail. Large blocks of contiguous spectrum is not a characteristic of the spectrum itself, but it's important to 5G. Large blocks of contiguous spectrum will allow carriers to support the latency and the speeds that a number of 5G services will be requiring. Next slide, please. So because of uh, the significant economic and social benefits that are expected to accrue from 5G and, and also the economic advantages that we've seen in the past flow from first mover status, many companies, uh, many countries, excuse me, have been moving aggressively to allocate uh, spectrum to 5G. Uh, the FCC in the US is, is one example, and they have aggressively pursued what they've called their 5G FAST plan. And a cornerstone of the FCC 5G FAST plan is the expedited release of low, mid, and millimeter wave spectrum, which the FCC has accomplished through a number of auctions over the last few years. The FCC FAST plan, though, is not limited to licensed spectrum. And Importantly, it also includes significant new allocations to unlicensed or Wi-Fi spectrum, which, as Paul mentioned, is expected also to see an important growth in traffic as a result of 5G and, and is often seen as a key element of the 5G ecosystem. Next slide, please. So ICED is, is uh, largely following the US allocations with, with somewhat of a lag. ICED completed its auction of some low band spectrum in the spring of last year, 600 megahertz spectrum. ICED has a mid band spectrum auction planned for the middle of this year. It was originally planned for earlier, but was pushed back due to COVID. And ICED is also looking at, a, at now, it's currently consulting on a significant additional allocation of mid band spectrum, sometimes referred to as 3.8 gigahertz. Um, and that should be 3.5 gigahertz as well on the slide. Uh, this is spectrum that is currently used for satellite services um, and, and ICID is considering reallocating that spectrum to, to, to mobile for use for 5G. And then ICID has also indicated uh, that it intends to auction off a significant amount of millimeter wave spectrum later in 2021. Next slide, please. So Canadian carriers uh, participated aggressively in, in the 600 megahertz auction uh, last year. The auction raised almost 3.5 billion, uh, which is a good chunk of change. To, and it resulted in the allocation of over 100 licenses. The licenses are for identified pieces of the spectrum band in specific geographic areas. Now, I'm not going to dive into the details of spectrum auctions. They're incredibly complex. But you may have heard the word set aside uh, in the context of these auctions. And a set aside is, is spectrum that, that's set aside for smaller and regional carriers uh, like Shaw, Videotron, and Eastlink. And that spectrum can only be bid on by those carriers. So the price uh, of that spectrum is significantly lower than the price of spectrum that is purchased by carriers like Bell, Rogers, and TELUS. And the policy objective behind the set aside is to facilitate greater competition in the provision of wireless services in Canada, which has been a longstanding policy objective of both ICED and the CRTC. Next slide, please. So Bell, Rogers and TELUS have all announced 5G deployments, in some cases uh, using the spectrum that they acquired in the 600 me megahertz auction. 
This is a quote from, from Joe Natale, who is the CEO of Rogers. And he's emphasizing the importance of, of 600 megahertz and the specific characteristics that I referred to earlier, namely the coverage uh, characteristic of 600, as well as the ability of 600 megahertz uh, spectrum to, to bring signals through dense urban areas. And the result is, is that spectrum is important both for urban and for rural applications. It's important for, for 5G, uh, it's important for smart cities, um, so urban areas. It's important for rural areas and industrial applications in those areas, such as farming, mining, manufacturing, and transportation. Next slide, please. So licensed spectrum is absolutely essential to the 5G service offering of wireless carriers. 5G, a 5G spectrum or a spectrum license generally grants to the carrier exclusive use of the spectrum in a geographic area. So this allows the carriers to ensure quality of service and satisfy service level commitments that are essential to all applications, but with to varying degrees. But I think it's really interesting to note um, the concept of, of network slicing, which is, is new to, to 5G as I understand it. And network slicing essentially allows a carrier to, to divvy up it, its 5G infrastructure into uh, private virtual networks. And each virtual network uh, can be tailored to the specific requirements of the, the use or the users. Um, so the, the network can be tailored to the, you know, the specific latency or capacity requirements that the user needs. And those are obviously going to be very variable. The service level that we, you, you and I require when we're on a phone call is significantly different from the service level that's required for autonomous vehicles or for mission critical um, monitoring of infrastructure. So this is an important uh, capability of, of 5G networks. Networks, next slide, please. But as Paul said, um, let's not forget Wi-Fi, let's not forget unlicensed spectrum. Uh, unlicensed spectrum and Wi-Fi are, are, absolutely, are absolutely critical. We're, we do expect to see a lot of innovation. We do now, most of us, when we're at home or, or, or outside in, in public places or, or restaurants uh, and cafes, we are now, most of us, initially connecting uh, to, to the internet over Wi-Fi. Uh, that will continue, um, but we're going to see more and more devices connecting through Wi-Fi and then into the 5G infrastructure. Because it's unlicensed, the, the spectrum is shared and it doesn't benefit from the interference protection of licensed spectrum. Uh, which means it can't meet the serv same service level requirements, um, but, but still an important piece of, of the 5G ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I've, I've, been, um, I've been focusing on, on spectrum, uh, but I wanna turn now uh, and switch gears a bit and, and talk about radio equipment and the 5G radios and, and, and user devices that will need to be deployed throughout Canada. Wireless equipment, the radios and our phones, uh, must satisfy ICED standards and ICED certification requirements. And the ICED standards focus on, on two key issues. Uh, the first is protection of health and safety. Health Canada has established limits of human exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic energy. And those limits are expressed in a document that is frequently referred to as safety code six. So I said requires that all radio apparatus uh, that's deployed in Canada comply with safety code six. The second key driver of I said technical standards is interference. And as, as the diagram depicts, and as you saw from, from, um, from the initial picture of the Canadian table of frequency allocations, we've got many, many different adjacent uses of different spectrum bands. And in order for the services to function effectively in those bands, uh, they need protection from interference from adjacent services. 
So I said has detailed rules to protect against or mitigate against interference uh, between different users and uses uh, of a spectrum. Next slide, please. So a carrier has, has purchased spectrum. It's got its spectrum licenses. It's got some certified equipment. What's next? Well, the radios and the supporting facilities such as backhaul need to be employed. What's the most, or what are the most effective locations for these facilities? Well, in significant part, that's going to be along streets and highways and in public places where people congregate. This means that timely and cost-effective access to streets and other public places and supporting infrastructure is vital to competitive and efficient rollout of 5G services in Canada. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and Paul mentioned as well, the millimeter wave frequencies that will be used uh, by 5G to carry large amounts of data, those radio frequencies, those radio signals do not travel that far. So what that means is, is that we're going to need many more radios than are currently deployed for our existing wireless services. And these radios are variously called femto cells, pico cells, and micro cells. Long story short, they're small. And they're ideally supported um, by existing street furniture. And by street furniture, I mean street lights and traffic lights, telephone poles, hydro poles, bus shelters, and buildings. And the slides show a picture of a couple of small cells on a building. Um, and I believe on a street light. So in order to, to make these deployments, uh, carriers need to access the streets and this supporting infrastructure. Now, telecommunication service providers currently have a qualified right to access uh, streets and other public places to construct and, and maintain transmission facilities but it's subject to reaching agreement on terms with the public authority that controls access to the place. And if agreement can't be reached, dispute resolution by the CRTC. But there are concerns about whether or not this qualified right of access covers wireless equipment, as well as the timelines that are required to get access, to go through the permitting process, and if necessary to go through a dispute resolution process. Next slide, please. Now the more traditional, uh, very large uh, towers that we already currently have, they will continue to be required for, for 5G services. And ICED is, is active in this area. It has established a, a tower and site sharing policy. And under this policy, carriers are required to share sites and towers if that's possible. And they're also required to consult extensively to, prior to constructing a new tower. And that consultation must include local land use authorities and local residents. The process, though, again, can be extraordinarily long, uh, particularly if there are disputes. Next slide, please. And finally, there's, there's backhaul deployment. Um, backhaul can be either fiber, which is you know, traditional uh, lines that are largely deployed along streets, either underground in ducts or on poles. Um, but also there's a significant amount of wireless backhaul, which again uses, uses macro towers. And again, these facilities need to be deployed in, in, in streets and other public places. And so, carriers need to be able to navigate on a timely and, and cost-effective basis access to, to these areas, as well as access to the support structures that will support the radios. Next slide, please. Now, it goes without saying that 5G network deployment will cost a lot of money. Bank of America Merrill Lynch estimates that Canadian carriers currently already have the highest capex or capital expenditure uh, per subscriber in the G7 and Australia. And the estimates of the investment required for 5G deployment uh, are also extremely high 
Uh, Axion Tour, for example, has estimated that it'll cost around 26 billion to deploy 5G wireless facilities uh, in Canada over the next seven years. So, so that's a lot of money. And not surprisingly, given the scale of the investment, wireless carriers are looking for regulatory certainty on a number of issues that will affect the cost and timelines for these investments and will affect the return on their investment in 5G infrastructure. Next slide, please. So what are the key areas of regulatory uncertainty for wireless carriers right now? Well, the first is a lack of clarity and some gaps in jurisdiction around access to public rights of way and supporting infrastructure, the, the, the areas and, and support structures that I referenced earlier. And as I said, uh, the CRTC has jurisdiction and wireless carriers have a qualified right to, to enter onto public places and, and install their facilities. But there is uncertainty around whether or not that jurisdiction covers wireless facilities, meaning there's uncertainty with respect to 5G deployment. The Supreme Court of Canada also quite a few years ago determined that the CRTC does not have jurisdiction over access by telecommunications carriers to poles owned by provincial electric utilities. So as a result, if a tel telecommunication carrier cannot negotiate uh, effective terms of access to a pole, which as we know is, is, is a monopoly facility, there aren't two lines of poles typically down any street. In, in, in some cases, there's no recourse at all. And in other cases, there may be recourse to a provincial energy regulator, but that regulator has no mandate to pursue telecommunications policy objectives, including any policy objectives related to 5G. So that is also a concern. And, and finally, there's a question about whether the CRTC's jurisdiction over support structures would extend to some of that street furniture that I was talking about before. So, so the street lights and, and the best shelters and, and the public buildings, which are ideal uh, to support uh, 5G small cells, but they're only ideal if you can get cost effective and, and, and timely access. Another key area of regulatory uncertainty is mandated wholesale services. The CRTC launched a proceeding in 2019 to consider whether it should require wireless carriers to provide wireless services at, whole at wholesale um, to, at regulated or tariff rates, which would mean that resellers would have access to the wireless services at the mandated rates and would compete with wireless carriers in the marketplace. A decision on that proceeding is pending and it is clearly absolutely crucial to, to the business decision, to the determination of the return on investment in 5G infrastructure in Canada. And to my knowledge, other jurisdictions have not mandated that kind of 5G access to wireless in general and to 5G in particular. And finally, there's a concern about timely resolution of disputes. I've mentioned that the CRTC and I said have some jurisdiction over access disputes in some areas, but the timelines for resolution of those disputes can be extraordinarily long. Time is money, construction seasons are short. Um, so this is an important uh, a factor and an important driver of cost uh, and deployment of 5G infrastructure in Canada. So with that, I think I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Julia to talk to us more about uh, the kinds of applications that the consumers and businesses can expect to, to see with 5G. Thank you very much, Leslie. Much appreciated. Um, so I'm gonna take us a little less technical and talk about how businesses and consumers can experience 5G now into the future and then into the far future. So just to recap, 5G, it's a catch-all name for fifth generation wireless technologies. That technology, according to the 3GPP consortium, um, is any system using 5G new radio software, that's 5G. And the promise of 5G is unprecedented speed and signal quality, increased speeds derived from higher radio frequency waves, and more about bandwidth. 
the promise is that it's going to make connected devices exchange data faster in much bigger chunks. And that promise is a breakthrough across all industries. Increased bandwidth per channel, aka more information and data through a single connection. Now, as this map shows, in 2019, 2018, 5G was not available in Canada. Instead, we relied on existing 3G, 4G network technologies. In fact, most of us probably still are to this day. Um, and those 3G, 4G te technologies were using, doing some of the things we talk about when we talk about the future of 5G, such as use remote sensors, automation, and early Internet of Things applications. And those technologies together with Wi-Fi and other technologies plus 5G are going to be our future. So other countries have already moved on to the 5G deployment as seen on this map. So this is a couple of years dated. Um, purple is deployed 5G, green is zero deployed 5G. Next slide, please. Thanks. So finally this year, 2020, as my colleagues have said, three major carriers launched their 5G networks to consumers and businesses in Canada. Other carriers are expected to follow. Uh, for example, Shaw has one in development. However, no clear path yet to for other carriers such as discount prepaid, regional carriers, or mobile virtual network operators to get onto 5G. That's yet to be determined. Um, there's also plans in the works by internet service providers to use 5G to expand home and wireless broadband. And of course, for us consumers, we need to keep in mind 4G cell phones are not able to use these new networks. So we're going to require 5G enabled wireless devices. Next slide, please. So only 5G enabled mobile devices can be used on 5G. So far in Canada, that means we need devices from Samsung, Motorola, LG, Google, Apple. So you have this device and you have this new carrier 5G plan. What does that mean for a consumer? So as both my colleagues have mentioned, um, download speeds will be multiple times faster than we had already on 4G LTE. That means we're gonna, that our device is going to work with existing 3G and 4G as well, um, so that we have a continuous coverage and continuous connectivity. Now, for us consumers who are like the stat of being able to download that movie in three seconds or five seconds or six seconds, we should know that in some U US cities, 5G networks are already testing downloads at speeds of 1.4 gigs per second on their 5G networks. For businesses, as connection, we need to keep in mind that as connection speeds increase, so does the volume of data on the network. So we need the right tools to analyze that traffic and the costs that it imposes on our use. So it's an opportunity for strategic planning. Where can 5G make the most impact for your business in the short or the long term? And 5G should be a part of the mix of connection solutions used for a business that currently relies on a lot of connectivity or could in the future for an opportunity that they want to take advantage of. It's an opportunity to develop new technology and applications, analyze use cases where things like remote sensors, automation, or edge of network processing would give a business a competitive edge or increase safety, uh, reduce costs, or open up new opportunities. And it's a fact that new devices, services, and businesses will develop and will be needed as part of this new 5G ecosystem. Some companies are already working on this. For example, we've all heard about autonomous cars and the various stages of testing and, and implementation that those have seen. And remote sensors are used in a lot of different industries already. And along with these new developments will come new risks, such as cybersecurity risks. So need tight protocols that are effective and appropriate for 5G. Next slide, please. So that's 5G right now, but what is it going to be around the corner? So to quote US President Donald Trump, speaking on the opportunity of um, 5G, no matter where you are, you'll have access very quickly to 5G and it's going to be a different life. I don't know if it's going to be a better life, maybe you're happy right now, but I'm going to say technologically it won't even be close. So I think that aptly sums up both the great expectations that many people have for 5G and also the vagueness of those expectations. So I'm going to take you through some more concrete examples of what 5G will do for consumers and for businesses based on the technologies and opportunities that are already materializing. 
those opportunities are based on the 5G's network characteristics that both Paul and Leslie have spoken to. Um, and they're expected to result in that low latency, that fast back and forth of data in and out, increased speed, increased reliability, distributed processing, that data processing, instead of being in the cloud or at a central data center, out to the edge of the network, and generally increased connectivity. Next slide, please. So even though 5G is wireless, its application is not restricted to mobile applications. Um, for example, last mile connectivity can be provided by 5G wireless for broadband and internet solutions. It's the fiber to phone concept. Um, so due to increased bandwidth, it is expected that the 5G networks will not exclusively serve cell phones like existing mobile networks, but will also be used as general internet service providers for laptops, desktop computers, home internet connected devices, and thus will compete with existing internet service providers such as cable internet. And we'll also make possible new applications in the internet of things and machine to machine areas that again, Paul alluded to. For consumers, we can expect wider spread adoption and uptake of these devices enabled for 5G as the consumer accessible networks roll out, especially in cities. We're gonna get download speeds, maybe up to 10, 20 times uh, higher than current 4G. The greater speeds combined with unlimited data plans um, could push out conventional broadband for some use cases. So like so many con home consumers dropped home phone lines once they had got a smartphone, reliable 5G with unlimited data plans will allow consumers to drop home internet connections. As well, mobile phones can serve as hotspots to drive home internet to smart home applications and devices. Every mobile phone with a 5G connection, just like a 4G connection, is an independent internet connection. And all this is gonna to lead to a shift in the industry, a shift in the technologies we acquire and how we get our service providers as consumers, and probably a lot more devices in our homes. Next slide, please. So uh, as Paul alluded to earlier, the internet of things. This, the promise of this here is that enhanced connectivity without network congestion. So lots of back and forth of devices to either other devices or to centralized sensors. So a non 5G example of this that exists right now is you have a smart home thermometer and then you've got various sensors around your house and those can all feed back in. There's lots of home smart home devices right now that can tell you security protocols like when windows and doors are opened and have pre-programmed protocols to react based on what the sensors are telling. So scale that up, expand it out to a bunch more use cases and industrial applications. And that's some of the things we're gonna see in the internet of things. Sensors and other data collection devices combining with low latency and edge computing to allow internet of things to expand out further and further. Um, back in 2019, Ericsson forecasted that there would be 5 billion cellular Internet of Things connections by the year 2025. They're going to increasingly use 5G, but already there is some cellular um, Internet of Things operating. It's a rapidly going ecosystem based on 3GPP global standards. 5G will continue to work with those and we'll probably need additional um, conventions as well. Next. Slide, please. Thank you. So this is an, applica an application of uh, 5G that we've already talked about and that you've heard about generally, the automated car. The flip side of the automated car, sorry, the autonomous car, is the connected car, a car that is always on, always connected to the internet. So for entertainment purposes, for software updates, for security. It's still a long ways away from general adoption here, uh, especially here in Canada and usage, but many of the technological hurdles have already been resolved. And a lot of the issues that remain before there's widespread adoption of connected and autonomous vehicles are of a social or legal nature. Next slide, please.
So as Paul mentioned earlier, um, augmented and virtual reality are other applications for 5G. For now, shopping and entertainment are the driving forces. For a deeper, richer experience, you could get an augmented reality uh, shopping experience, but it can go a lot further. Think of all that futuristic technology that we've seen in sci-fi movies where people are tracked and have ads projected at them as they walk down the street through the city. So we're not near that level yet, but with the right consumer devices and applications and consents to privacy um, and the disclosure of personal information, we could go down that path and be in that kind of uh, futuristic world that we've only seen so far through the movies. Next slide. Agriculture. So tracking animals with connected devices, whether or not you knew it, is not actually new. Um, it's already done, but with 5G, there's a promise to make these applications faster and easier. thus leading to increased adoption, use, and on the side of that, a lot of more data management issues. So even back in 2019, there was a test in England, 50 dairy cattle were um, set with high speed smart collars that worked on 5G to control robotic milking machines. There was opportunity for other data to be sent back and forth, but the core functionality was testing how 5G might transmit data between sensors and the milking machine faster than a rural broadband connection could do. So it was pretty simple. When a cow entered, walked into the milking station, the caller would alert the machine and it would begin connecting and pumping. Next slide, please. Thank you. So industrial manufacturing, again, no surprise here. The low latency, high reliability, edge computing, all of that will allow for increased production automation, machine monitoring, diagnosis and maintenance, and hopefully reduce costs. Next slide. For healthcare, we already saw with the pandemic a huge shift towards telemedicine um, that we experienced here. But instead of just a phone call or a video chat with your provider, with scaled out 5G uh, applications, you could have high definition video, even 3D imaging, and bio data feedback from wearable sensors to your healthcare provider. There's a lot of potential use cases here, such as blood sugar monitoring to diabetics, automatically adjusting a feedback to change insulin um, pump use as well, and all that data going to an analytics that your healthcare provider has, and real-time monitoring of people's um, status. There's been mentions of virtual surgeries and things like that. They're not here yet, but increasingly we're going to see more and more applications. Next slide, please. So we have lots of applications potentially in transportation, in drones, in emergency applications. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when I talk about another slide further on. Next slide, please. Of course, in natural resources and in the energy sectors, you have highly valued um, large infrastructure projects that are remote, don't have good broadband um, connectivity necessarily, and time and data, real-time data can be essential to not just health and safety, but also realizing the value of that asset and ensuring production is going correctly. So, Remote monitoring, diagnostics, maintenance of equipment, asset management, and even remote monitoring of human resources are some possible applications we'll see scale out. Next slide. So then also urban management is a potential application or realm of applications really. Um, smart city, smart street lighting, combining with autonomous vehicles. You can definitely see a potential future where if there's things like ubiquitous autonomous cars, why not have street lights um, and all the other infrastructure of our road networks, such as admission to on ramps for highways and things like that, all integrated into um, a remote sensor and data processing system where there's a lot more connectivity between the 
autonomous vehicle and the overall network to create a smoother, safer driving experience or transportation experience because you wouldn't really be driving. Let's go to the next slide, please. So that's some looks at things that are in production, starting to roll out, being developed already, um, things you might see in the near-ish future. But beyond that, kind of like what Paul was referring to earlier on, 5G is not just going to be faster internet downloading your movie in six seconds. There's sort of a qualitative change that can happen here because you're going to scale up from some devices per square kilometer to a million devices per kilometer. So that's going to have some network effects and there's going to be things we haven't even invented yet. Ubiquitous um, 5G and next generation Wi-Fi are going to work together. If connection speed, latency, and bandwidth are not issues, then there's no limited on the connected devices and opportunities that they could offer. I think we're going to see a lot of things in the Internet of Things, device to device connection, interaction, processing, and operations. And one thing I think we're going to see more of is on the next slide, please. So smart contracts. Um, there's an example there in the, in the pictures on your screen. A smart contract is a computer program or transaction protocol, which is intended to automatically execute, control, or document legally relevant events and actions according to the terms of the contract or agreement. So the objectives of smart contracts are the reduction of the need for trusted intermediaries. Think of a bank. Um, reduce the need for arbitrations, enforcement costs, fraud losses, as well as a reduction of malicious and accidental exceptions. Now, a smart contract is not necessarily a legal contract, depending on the usage of the term, but could certainly be combined with a legal agreement to automate the implementation of the outcomes of the contract. So some examples um, that existed historically and are used, usually used to describe what smart contracts are, are a vending machine. You put in money, you press a button, out pops your candy bar. Or um, even things now where we're revolving automated trades. So you've got an account, you put in instructions, when a certain price hits, you then have your trade happen. Futuristically looking, um, Think of car leases that automatically bill you by the kilometer, your location, the path you take on your driving, your speed, your safety of your driving. Um, that could be a smart contract application. And on the industrial side, think of automatic payment adjustments for missed service levels. Um, my colleague mentioned before, looking at service levels for connectivity, is connectivity as a service. Well, there's a computer that you agree knows when you're up and when you're down in terms of connectivity. If you're down, there's an outage. There's a service level that says you're dinged X dollars per minute of outage. That could be a smart contract automatically adjusting the price of that agreement. So lots of interesting things to be built out around smart contracts and the Internet of Things in the future. Going to require a lot of new technology, a lot of new IP. And my colleague uh, Jean-Nicolas is going to talk to you about the applications of that IP and how to protect it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Julia. Let's go straight away to the next slide, please. When talking about the impact of patents on pretty much any sector of technology, I like to use the analogy of the matrix, which really is about perception of reality versus actual reality. And how does that translate in the world of, of patents? Well, if you had the proper set of lens, you would actually see all the patents around you. For example, when I take my iPhone, uh, there's thousands of patents that are applicable to an iPhone, which obviously we do not see in the real world. But if we had the proper set of lens, we would see that same thing with the electrical wiring in our houses, uh, the lighting system and so on and so forth. What does that mean for 5G next? Next slide, please. So in the world of 5G, you've got a bunch of companies that participated in setting the 5G standard. And what happens is that the companies that participate in the standard setting do take patents that map on, uh, on the standard. And that's why you have companies like Huawei, Ericsson, Samsung, Nokia, and so on, 
that actually own thousands of patents that map on 5G. So when you're deploying 5G within anything, if you have a connected device that's connected to 5G, you are actually infringing or using patented technology. Next slide, please. So what does that mean for you? And what's the difference? Why are we talking about this today with respect to 5G? Was it an issue, for example, in 3G? Was it an issue in 4G? The answer is it was. But in 3G and 4G, the ecosystem, the connected ecosystem was very different. You had companies that were smartphone manufacturers and you had carriers and those companies uh, oftentimes did fight each other uh, around patents and around standard essential patents like standard like patents that mapped on 3G or 4G by example you you've all heard of the uh, telecom wars the telecom wars that made the newspapers for a number of years was a lot of that was around patents that mapped on 3G and 4G in 5G the ecosystem the the ecosystem of companies that are going to be impacted by standard essential patents, by patents that map on 5G are a bit different. You're going to have connected devices manufacturers from uh, smart clothing to smart watches to connected cars. Actually, uh, a car now is a connected device. And I can tell you that there are some owners of standard essential patents today that are suing car manufacturers for their connectivity features that is happening today. So it has an impact on companies that are gonna develop connected devices that will connect to 5G or users of connected devices, but somewhere down the line, someone needs to pay the price for, uh, for using these, uh, these patents. So what does that mean for you if you are a developer of connected devices? You want to you want to develop you are developing technology that will connect to 5G. The the first answer to that is first of all you need to be aware of the issue and it's part of what we're doing today is sort of raising the awareness uh, on this particular issue and topic. And once you're aware of it, there are certain things that you can do. For example, you can implement certain design choices. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can go to, let me pause and step back a bit. There's actually subsets of what you're gonna put in your connected device. There are chipsets, for example, that will have the connectivity features to 5G. So you actually need to go to, to the market. If you, are, if you are developing a connected device, part of that connected device, for example, might be that chipset that allows you to connect to 5G. Some of those chipsets come, in our jargon, we say fully indemnified, meaning that the manufacturer of the chipset tells you, I've secured all the rights to the patent, you are good to go. Obviously, there's a price tag attached to that. So that's what I mean by design choices. You, you, you need to make sure if you are buying a higher price subset of these devices, uh, you, you, you've made a design choice that, has, that will have an impact on your pricing. Whereas you could buy a chipset that comes with zero warranties on IP infringement with zero indemnification. And, and obviously the price is gonna be lower. So your end price is gonna be lower, but you could end up being the one that has to pay for these patents that map on 5G. You can also go to patent pools. Patent pools are a one-stop shop where you can get access to thousands of patents that map on a particular standard. There will be a patent pool for 5G. If you take a license from that patent pool, you have secured rights to thousands of license, to thousands of patents. So again, certain choices that you can make that will uh, diminish your risk if you are a manufacturer of connected devices. If you're a user of connected devices, then your contracts with whoever is providing you with the connected device becomes super important because as a user, you might be infringing 
the patent, but you may want to get certain warranties and, sent, and certain indemnification provisions from your uh, from from the company that you're dealing with that is selling to you the connected device. So you may want to warranty that they have secured all the rights on the patents, that there is no patent infringement, and uh, and get indemnification from them if uh, if there is an issue around the, these patents. So again, the purpose today, sort of raise the level of awareness on these issues and giving you an idea or a sense of what you can uh, do about, about these things. And I believe that we, with this, we uh, will now move on to the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, JN, and thank you to our panelists for the uh, very interesting presentations. We do have a number of questions that have come in. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And what I'll do is I'll direct a question to a particular panelist, but then invite the other panelists to uh, jump in and, and uh, add their thoughts. So the first question deals with the um, controversial nature of 5G deployment. We saw the news reports over the summer of uh, telecom masts in the United Kingdom and Netherlands being attacked or set on fire by 5G protesters. And, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll start off with Paul on this one, but invite others to comment as they want. So, Paul, with all this promise of a better future, why on earth would anyone protest 5G? What, what is, what is the, the controversial nature of this technology? Well, I think, <clears throat> like any sort of major new opportunity there's there's going to be resistors and, and we are in an environment in a world right now where um, not only can uh, where a, a small amount of information uh, put in the hands of, of certain people can be used to weaponize to create misinformation to give a sense that there are greater dangers associated with uh with a form of technology than you than uh, than than actually exist and you know in this is uh, a feature of the world we're in right now. People overreact to those as well, and it's spread on social media. And, and we see this uh, causing uh, social media itself spreading these rumors and, and allowing for the uh, you know groups of individuals to attack what is essentially very critical infrastructure. And um, you know, in part, it stems from concerns about health effects. But as my colleague Leslie pointed out, and I'll, I'll turn over to her, uh, that the health effects uh, are largely misguided. The, the concerns about health effects are largely misguided as well. Lizzie, do you want to pick up on that point? Well, I think, Paul, you pretty much covered it, but absolutely. I mean, Health Canada and I said have been all over this uh, health and safety issue from the get-go. Uh, safety Code 6 is based on very thorough consideration of, of the studies that are, uh, have been done uh, on the potential effects of uh, radio frequency emissions and uh, Canadian standards are consistent with international standards. So, so there is close attention to ensuring uh, that safety considerations are fully met, but there is a, a group uh, of people that, that uh, think that the different standards are required. So for the next question, I think we'll stay with Leslie to begin with and Leslie, you talked about the, the jurisdiction of the CRTC with respect to regula uh, regulating the carriers and the role that ISET plays in spectrum allocation, as well as municipal land use regulatory bodies and provincial utility pools. So it seems like there's a potential for um, regulatory log jams where, you know, you can't get one step done because you need three other steps approved by some other regula regulator at some other um, level of government. And, you know, multi-jurisdictional regulatory schemes and regulatory overlap doesn't sound like a great formula for fast and efficient rollout of 5G infrastructure. Is there a way through? Is there a path which we can sort of map through all these jurisdictions? Well, I think there is a path where we can we can reconcile and streamline some of the issues that that we are running into. I mean, uh, there's there's no question that 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 public authorities, local authorities, have have to have some ability to to uh, guide and, and 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 speak to and negotiate terms of access. 
Um, but ultimately, because as Paul said, this is critical infrastructure and because cost effective and efficient deployment of that infrastructure is important to all Canadians, we need some more perhaps um, interventionist oversight and some clear direction on what happens at certain timelines. So if there's a dispute, if the access issue hasn't been resolved, if there's a bit of a roadblock, um, that there's a, a clear process with relatively expedited timelines to go to a regulator and get a decision on the issues. So all voices need to be heard, um, but we can't sort of s s go around and around in circles uh, forever hearing those voices. We need to move towards a resolution that's in the public interest. So I, I think there is room for more guidance. I mean, to date, we haven't seen a lot of conflict between, say, the CRTC and ICED on... Uh, the different access issues that they're looking at, but but in both cases we have dispute resolutions that aren't particularly fast. Uh, so I think you know a consolidated approach to dispute resolution, either at, at, likely at the CRTC, it seems like the the best placed agency, but it but we could also discuss I said, um, but I think with those you know, with a clear path, I think we, we can get to where we want to be. We've seen other jurisdictions uh, take more aggressive approaches uh, on establishing uh, rules for access. We've seen the FCC uh, implement some, some fairly strict rules about access to public places and support structures. And if certain timelines aren't met, then this, the FCC will take jurisdiction. We've also seen in, in Europe um, some approaches to facilitate access, uh, sometimes just with notice, uh, with dispute afterwards. So there are a number of different processes we could consider, but ultimately what we need is a clear expedited path to dispute resolution so we don't get stuck at one spot and go around and around in circles. Does anyone else want to pick up on that issue? Okay, moving on. Uh, Jean-Nicolas, we actually have patent questions. Um, so the first one is you put up the slide that showed the number of uh, patents, and I guess those were issued and applied patents that relate to 5G technology, and there's tens of thousands of them. How on earth does a new entrant who wants to deploy 5G solutions in a product or service ever do their due diligence? How do they, how do they navigate this huge uh, sea of potential patent infringement icebergs? Yeah, so that's that's a, actually a great question. I, I do not believe that there is like huge due diligence to do on this. You can take my word for it. There's thousands of patents that map on 5G. So so the answer to to the question to me is is maybe a bit different where whether you're if if you're a user of connect of, a, of connected technologies or a developer of connected technologies along the lines of what I said before. If you're a user, you're gonna put all of your efforts in your contract with whoever is selling you the connected device. Again, representations and warranties on IP infringement, uh, indemnification, maybe insurance, uh, a layer of insurance added to the, uh, to the contract obligations to seek certain types of insurance so that you're protected in the event that someone ever wanted to sue you for patent infringement. Now, I will say you. I, I will say this. I have been working uh, in the universe of standard essential patents for at least fifteen years now, and I would say that typically it is not the end users that are uh, that are sued. It is the end manufacturer, and what I mean by that is if the connect the connectivity component is added to a chipset, the chipset manufacturer will not be sued. If the chipset is then put into a connected device, whoever manufactures the connected device will at one point become a target for licensing and or infringement. Uh, as I said before, car manufacturers, the car as a connected device today is a target. Uh, so if you are a developer, then yes, at one point you may become a target. So what I would say is follow the data, follow the trends, uh, do put in place Google alerts on 5G patent infringement, just to get a sense of who ends up being sued because not everyone's gonna be a target. Um, 
people are going to go, like maybe car manufacturers will become a target, but not necessarily certain types of smart appliances or smart clothing. So just follow the trends, see what's happening. And, uh, and if you think that at one point you may become a target, well, the only thing I guess you can do then is seek uh, legal advice. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I think this one's probably for you. Um, with the, the description of, you know, millions of connected devices and the Internet of Things and so many more connections and so much more data being uh, transferred through 5G networks, is there a concern that there's now increased vulnerability to nefarious actors, to, you know, systems being hacked or compromised by either foreign or domestic threats? Uh, you know, what, what is the security um, that we need to be concerned about as we roll out these networks? Yeah, there, you hear a lot of concern uh, about security in the context of 5G. And I think when a lot of individuals talk about security in 5G, it, it can be separated into two specific things. It, it, there's there's a, an issue with respect to privacy, privacy and individuals' data that they have, but also the security and access to the network. One is a means by which somebody can access personal data, but there's also a concern, like I said, about how that data is used and, and if the various actors can get access to it. But I think we need to remember firstly that um, there are privacy considerations that don't necessarily engage security considerations as well. Um, in, in Canada, we have privacy legislation that's principles-based. It's based on, on consent to collect it, to use it, to disclose data. And, and I don't think you're gonna see any change in a material respect of, um, of privacy legislation, we don't necessarily need to see that, but because the volume and the intensity and the value of that data is going to increase so much and exponentially over the years, uh, you're going to see that the, the value for a company of having good privacy principles in place is going to be exponentially greater. I mean, consider the ways, and, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned this earlier, think of the ways an organization could accidentally misuse data that it collects, uh, such as uh, an organization that installs implants, uh, medical impl implants in individuals, and, and it collects that information and accidentally uses or discloses it in some other ways. Um, just last month, I this will really scare the, uh, the privacy lawyers on the call, but just last month, I, I read a press release from Ericsson and they were talking about a pilot 5G remote health monitoring initiative at a digital industry conf conference in Russia. And it was premised on uh, using 5G radio uh, architecture, and it used a combination of thermal imaging and mobile uh, video terminals to conduct ongoing temperature checks, use of personal protective equipment, and it was monitoring individuals' movements to ensure social distancing. Uh, you can see the type of information they're collecting here is not only going to be very important, but it could be very, very potentially personal. And so there's a risk that 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 data is ever shared. But to, to your specific point, that was my really circuitous way of getting there, is that, you know, it, it may not be an unintentional or, or uh, improper use or collection. It may be that there is a, an external third party that's trying to get access to it to, to use it for, for nefarious purposes. And, and I think the, the greatest concern about 5G is that because, like I mentioned, it's a distributed network where you have radio equipment that, that goes uh, uh, further to the edge, and you have more nodes of interconnection where a, a party that's sophisticated, much more sophisticated than I can, I am, can access the radio network in, in, in far out areas where it's going to be much more difficult for an organization that monitors the access to its network to, to actually monitor that portion of the network. So if it's on the far out edge, you have more uh, attack vectors in which, uh, you know, a party can can access your network and it'll take you longer to diagnose and triage that that portion of the network so so that's why we hear so much uh concern about security but it but it needs to be you need to recognize that there's there's a, a separate and important privacy component to to those concerns as well thank you uh julia for you you described um, a lot of the potential applications for 5g technology in a number of different industries uh, but we also know that there's a lot of hype around 5G. It's, you know, it's become one of the sort of the buzzwords and everyone's promoting a 5G enabled this and 5G enabled that. <clears throat> what sort of questions should a, uh, a business be asking itself as it's considering whether or not there are 5G advantages from adopting 5G te technology? What, what sort of activities um, would 
a business be involved in that it would lead it naturally to want to investigate uh, potential 5G solutions? Sure. So, I mean, I probably can't cover every possible um, case use scenario for industry, but certainly starting from a position of if I could have a sensor collecting that data and sending it back to a computer that would not only record it, but measure it and monitor it and send the alerts about when certain thresholds are met or fall below um, or, or exceeded, that's a potential use case for um, a lot of remote sensors. And then how are you gonna connect them all and network them um, if they're not easily connectable to a broadband, uh, an existing system, then you're talking about, well, maybe 5G. If you've got um, either personnel or assets that are physically remote from you, either for some or all of the time, and you want data about location and condition, um, that's another potential use case there for you. And beyond that, it can kind of escalate. So um, 5G is layered on top of your existing connectivity solutions, but if you don't currently know something, you don't have that data, because it's too cumbersome to go get it, then there might be a remote uh, sensing or 5G solution that gets you that information. If you're a company that, um, of course, is on the manufacturer's side, then you know, you're already working, looking at automation and the faster, more accurate real-time data that you can get means the more precise um, and more detailed your automation could possibly be. And it could be setting you up for sort of a next generation of automation. All this increased data, of course, leads into the need to process that data, the need to have systems and servers and um, algorithms and so software that can use it and display it to the human component in a way that we can comprehend and make business decisions based on. So, you know, if you're a business that's in, uh, in a device manufacturer or programmer, um, programming or application software development um, business, there's huge realms of applications for business to business or internal use um, that are out there. Um, and that's quite aside from all the consumer facing things. So ask yourselves, if I could know about this right now, um, and I don't right now, and I can make a business decision based on it, if I could have that data faster or more defined, um, then that's an opportunity for you to start investing in 5G or looking forward to how you could make connectivity a bigger part of your overall asset management or production um, plan. Great, thanks very much. And Leslie, I think we have one more for you. And you've been involved in disputes uh, around the construction of cell towers and, and land use planning issues. So if we have to go to a system with deploying tens of thousands of the micro cells across an urban landscape, is this going to complicate the approval process? And I guess it layers on top then uh, thousands of commercial agreements to with with private property owners. How how does that unfold? Do you think? Well, I think that the hope would be that that and and in many cases this is how it already works. For example, with a municipality, is there's a single agreement, and it would would cover uh, all of your your access requirements to that municipality or to a certain type of locations in that municipality and would set out all of the terms of and conditions of access. So, so you would try as much as possible to have umbrella agreements uh, that would, would set out the terms. Um, and, and from a regulatory perspective, it would be great to have as much um, guidance as possible in terms of what those terms should look like, particular with respect to timelines for permit processing and, and fees, um, which are our key issues. Uh, of dispute, um, so so there it there there could be a lot of agreements, but I, I I'm not sure it's going to change all that much. I think most of the actors uh, are already in place, certainly from a, a government standpoint and the local governments. 
Um, there are already access agreements with it for existing wireline and wireless facilities and their umbrella agreements. There may be more uh, agreements with private landholders, but again, that's not new. Um, a lot of macro towers are on private land. It's correct that there'll be more of them. Um, and if in a city, uh, it ends up being the case that a lot of those new small cells need to be attached to buildings and it could involve a lot of different agreements with different people. Um, but I think uh, what people see as being the most effective approach is to really work through that, that street furniture and, and publicly owned infrastructure, if that's possible. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, that brings us to the end of our time for the webinar. So I thank you very much for our panelists. And thank you very much for everyone who uh, signed in and sent in questions. Please remember that the recordings of the session are available at the Faskin Institute section of Faskin.com. And we would again ask you to please complete the survey uh, linked below. So with that, we'll say good afternoon and thank you very much.